Okay, uh, so our next speaker is Kapil Arya, who will be uh, talking about uh, DMTCP, or bringing Checkpoint Restart to Python. Uh, so, thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. Hi. Uh, so, I am a grad student at Northeastern, and uh, uh, this is my first time here at SciPy, and I'm really thrilled to be here. Thanks. So, my research uh, focuses on checkpoint restart and process level virtualization. And in this talk, I'll be talking about, um, uh, this is a talk about integrating or uh, interfacing Python with the checkpoint restart package that uh, we have at Northeastern. And this is a joint work with Gene Kuberman, my advisor. Now, the first thing is, uh, what is checkpoint restart? Well, checkpointing is actually the ability to save a set of uh, running processes onto disk so that you can later restart them uh, in case of a node failure or if you uh, want to shut down something and uh, restart later. So the very traditional motivation uh, for checkpointing was uh, around the fault tolerance. So if you have a really huge uh, long running computation, say going over 30 days, and on day 29, a node crashes and uh, well, that's a disaster. You don't want to restart all over again. Well, if you have checkpointing, then you can uh, restart from the last checkpoint image. And let's say in a very naive way, you are checkpointing every six hours. So in the worst case, you lost six hours of computation as opposed to losing all 29 days. Well, in this work, uh, I'm talking about DMTCP, which stands for Distributed Multi-Threaded Checkpointing. It's actually um, a quite a robust and mature package which has been around for about eight years, and uh, it works completely in user space, no kernel re modifications required, and you don't need to modify your binary, it just works on unmodified uh, binaries. Uh, also, it's open source, LGPL, freely on uh, SourceForge, and also now we have binary packages for various distros. Using DMTCP is uh, uh, really simple. It's like just a set of uh, Linux commands. You just uh, use DMTCP checkpoint, uh, whatever your application is, and uh, in order to create a checkpoint, you just give the checkpoint command, and finally you can restart. So I'll give you a quick demo of uh, how it works. So here we have, in this shell, I'm starting checkpoint Python, and I have a very simple counter program, which is doing nothing fancy, just uh, counting. So one, two, three, and so on. In a different shell, I'm going there and issuing a checkpoint command. So what it will do is it will take a snapshot of this running process. So let's uh, just say between 16 and 17. So it took a checkpoint. The process is uh, uh, still continuing. And sometime later, I may decide to kill it. Once I'm here, I may now want to restart the computation. And restarting is really easy. You just invoke the restart script. And I press checkpoint after 16, so it actually started counting from 17. So this is a very simple, uh, trivial demo, but uh, it, it works. Uh, DMTCP works on a whole lot of uh, other applications. So it, it works on multi-threaded applications, multi-processes. Uh, it can you can checkpoint a computation running on a cluster, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, you can also checkpoint the things like MATLAB and R, and uh, obviously Python, Perl, or, and all sort of environments, as long as uh, it does not require root privilege to run. Now, what is involved in checkpointing is uh, the very first thing that uh, one can think of is uh, dumping the process memory, the entire user space memory, onto a file. But that is not sufficient. You have to take care of the open files, the network sockets, uh, and uh, the state of all user threads, all the parent-child relationships, and so on and so forth. So DMTCP takes care of this automatically for you, and all you have to do is just type in DMTCP command dash dash checkpoint, and uh, that is all done. Uh, the runtime overhead of DMTCP is really low. It works by creating uh, wrappers around some really infrequently used system calls to get uh, to gather information about the state of the process. So it's really lightweight, and um, in most cases, the overhead is uh, way less than 1%. Now, the typical use cases of checkpointing, like apart from the fault tolerance where you are uh, recovering from a, a, a crash after a, like a long computation or in long computation, uh, some of the use cases that might be uh, interesting to you are, uh, say, save and restore of workspace. If you have a long interactive uh, scientific session where you are doing some experiments and basically analyzing data and so on, and if you have a really long session, you can basically take a checkpoint, take it with you on the USB, restart it on your laptop, or basically resume it or whatever. Uh, it also allows you to do what-if analysis. So you take a checkpoint, and you took some branch, and then you decide, well, this branch didn't work out. I have to go back and take a different branch. And that also can be done with checkpointing. 
And later in this talk, I'll also be talking about how checkpointing can be used to improve the debugging experience, uh, in particular, how to add reversibility to an existing debugger. And uh, so over here, I actually uh, listened to some of the talks where uh, there was this issue with uh, long initialization times. So if you have a long initialization time, you can uh, start one process, do all the initialization, create a checkpoint there, and now restart from the checkpoint and uh, distribute it over the cluster or actually fork all the processes and so on. So that actually can save you a whole bunch of time. You don't have to do anything there. It's, it's, it's very trivial, at least from the checkpointing point of view. And then there are a whole bunch of uh, uh, other applications which uh, some of our users have uh, pointed us to. Now, whatever I've discussed so far has been available for some years now. Like, what is new in this talk? Well, in this talk, this is all about integrating it from within Python so that the Python programmer can tell like, when to create a checkpoint or when to uh, restart from a previous checkpoint. Like the earlier example that I gave uh, in the demo, we actually checkpointed from the outside so you don't have any control on where actually you want to create the checkpoint. But if you can use it from within in, uh, DMTCP, uh, within uh, Python, that would be uh, really great and that's what uh, uh, this is all about. So, to do this, we created a simple uh, Python module. So you start your uh, Python shell with dmtcp underscore checkpoint. So this is about the interactive session uh, in this slide. So you start Python with dmtcp checkpoint, you do your usual stuff, and you import dmtcp uh, module. Now, in this example, I'm setting x to one and then requesting a checkpoint. So dmtcp dot checkpoint will create a checkpoint uh, and uh, save it on the disk. Now, say sometime later, you basically uh, messed up the environment or took a wrong branch or whatever, and you want to restore. Well, you can just say dmtcp.restore, and if you do print x there, uh, you can see the value of x is printed as 1. So it basically took you back to the original location where you took the checkpoint. And as with the previous demo, you can also restart it from the shell, just uh, execute the restart script, and uh, it resumes from where uh, it was checkpointed. Now, the previous example was really trivial. You just uh, imported DMTCP and did checkpoint. But what if you want to do something more? Uh, in, in a lot of applications, people want to do some pre-processing before a checkpoint is written. Like you might want to discard some data, or you might want to close some sockets, or you might want to actually notify someone that, I, oh, I'm going to be checkpointed, and so on. So for that, you can actually create a simple function, which actually is a wrapper for DMTCP.checkpoint. And you can do pre-processing. After the checkpoint is done, uh, when the process is resuming from the checkpoint, you can do some uh, resume processing. And also, if you are doing some restart, if you are restarting from a previous checkpoint, you can do some processing uh, there as well. So uh, here is the simple uh, sample run. So for the checkpoint resume, you can see it uh, did the pre-checkpoint and the resume hook. And finally, if you are just restarting from a previous checkpoint, you only execute the, uh, uh, the, the, the very last restart hook. Now, the Python module can also be used to manage sessions. So if you are running and uh, you took a bunch of checkpoints, you can basically see all the checkpoints. You can uh, delete one of the sessions or rename and so on. Also, right now, it actually is uh, very primitive. So it's actually showing you a list of all the sessions. But you can imagine uh, uh, some sort of a tree-like view where you can, uh, you can tell where was this particular checkpoint uh, coming from. Like there are four ancestor checkpoints, and there, is, there are two child checkpoints, and so on and so forth. So this is all uh, inside a very simple uh, Python uh, module for DMTCP. And finally, ipython.parallel. So DMTCP can checkpoint distributed computations which are connected through sockets and, and over a network. So ipython.parallel is quite popular. And uh, uh, you have a single um, checkpoint controller and multiple engines. So when DMTCP checkpoints it, it will checkpoint it as a single unit. So you don't have to worry about any data in transit or data loss or, or any sort of synchronization issues. DMTCP takes care of it automatically for you. And once you have checkpointed it, obviously you can migrate it to a new cluster. You can restart on the new set of nodes. Or if you are debugging and you don't, have, you don't want to re, uh, waste resources, you can just restart it on your laptop and then do all the debugging that you want to do. Debugging is slow, so you don't need much resources anyway. Now, in the next uh, slide, uh, Cython is not my uh, 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 preferred, or actually not, I, I shouldn't be saying preferred, it's not my strong point. But uh, this experiment is about uh, checking uh, Cython um, execution with various uh, CPython um, sessions. So what is going on is uh, you have a code which you compiled in Cython, and you want to verify whether it actually is uh, 
uh, producing the correct result as if, uh, if it were run in the uh, sequential interpreted mode with CPython. So what you do is, uh, when you're running with Python, you take checkpoints at predetermined locations. So in this case, we are taking a checkpoint at A, B, C, D, E, and F. So once you have created a checkpoint, now you can restart from that checkpoint and switch the modes from compiled to interpreted and run it until you hit the point B. At the end of point B, you can now compare the results of the interpreted versus the compiled mode, and if the results match, great, everything is fine. But if they don't, then you know that something is wrong in this particular segment, and then you can uh, proceed with debugging. And you can do all these uh, interpreted sessions in parallel. Even you can actually distribute them over a cluster. If there is a huge uh, computation, you can basically uh, distribute over a cluster, and since they are slow, uh, it's okay because they are running in parallel and they are executing only a small, tiny fragment of, uh, uh, of your exec uh, actual runtime. Okay. So next, I'm going to talk about Fred. So Fred is actually a, a set of Python scripts. It's basically, we call it fast reversible debugger. So Fred can be used to add reversibility to any existing debugger. And we, uh, we suspect that it will take less than a day to add reversibility to any of the, uh, any new debugger that you might have. So we initially actually wrote it for GDB, and then we realized that if we can actually abstract it, we can do it for Python, Perl, or MATLAB debugger. And you don't need the source code. You can just uh, use this script. All you need to know is what is the step equivalent in your debugger, or what is the finished equivalent in your debugger, and that is all you need to supply it, and some regular expressions. So the, sequ the scenario here is before using FRAD, you are, uh, you, there is a user who is talking directly uh, to the Python interpreter. Right? And there is this a.py which is being executed. You are using PDB to debug and do next and step and so on. But when Fred comes in, Fred is sitting in between the user and the actual debugger. So Fred intercepts all the commands, and then it figures out which commands are meant for Fred and which are meant for the debugger. So the commands meant for debugger go directly to debugger, and the rest are interpreted by the Fred uh, uh, API, and, uh, the Fred command, and actually uh, it takes uh, uh, steps uh, or actions depending on the command itself. Now, by doing that, uh, what we are able to do is uh, basically introduce a set of reverse commands. So you all know what a step command is, basically step into a function, or next is step over a function, and so on and so forth. So if I were to say you have to have a reversibility in a debugger, then the first thing you want to say is, well, I think I have stepped over this function, and the problem was in the function, but I'm now stepped over, so I have to restart from the beginning and then step in. Well, in the very trivial case, you can say, well, what if there was an undo command? Just do an undo, and then you can step in, right? Now, implementing undo is really easy, at least from the checkpointing point of view. You restart from the last checkpoint, and if you had n steps, you now execute n minus 1 commands, and there is your equivalent of undo. And similarly, you can extend it to all the, the reverse commands, reverse finish or um, uh, reverse uh, step and so on. Like, there are some situations where the last command was continue and you want to do a reverse next. Now, how do you do that? Well, in that case, Fred actually has some algorithms to decompose, continue into set of next commands so that you can now do undo on this extended history of the uh, debugging session. And it takes you back into the point where you actually want to go. Now, this is like all very primitive, like, okay, you can get Fred uh, reverse next, reverse step, but how can we actually make it even better? Well, we have reverse expression watch point. So, Everyone knows uh, what is a watch in GDB. You can say watch x greater than zero, and GDB will watch until the value of x is, or this expression is true. If the expression involves very simple, uh, uh, a simple variable or single variable, then GDB or anything can actually use the processor registers to put hardware breakpoints. But what if the expression was like complex? It took some time to actually compute something. Then you don't want to do an expression watch point on that, because after every instruction, if you are going to compute this, uh, this expression, then that can be quite costly. So what we provide is a reverse expression watch point with binary search. So let's look at this example. Here is a linked list, and the thing is, we want the linked list to, be, to have always less than a million nodes. If, it's, it has a, if it has greater than a million nodes, then there's a problem. Now, you can say that, well, we can keep a counter, but let's assume that there is no counter. So, the only way you can find is, after every insertion, you do a length of linked list, you compute this function, which goes over the entire linked list and tells you how many nodes are there. And that is super expensive. But if you have reverse expression watch point, you, run the, you take a checkpoint at the beginning, and you run your computation. At the end, you realize that, well, the length of linked list is greater than a million, so 
this is a fault, uh, this is an error. The fault must be somewhere between uh, my starting and the current point. Well, now you can do binary search. Since you can go back, you can do binary search. Binary search is logarithmic. So you get a midpoint, check the value whether it's true or not, and then you keep doing that until you get to the statement where the expression is true and doing a next will make it false. Now let me give you a real quick demo and uh, hopefully it will work. So here is a, a very trivial, uh, on the right hand side there is a very trivial uh, program which implements linked list now in Python. So what I'm going to do is uh, Fred app Python, then I'm specifying the debugger and then the uh, test list program. So what I'm going to do is on line say 20, um, 21, I'll put a breakpoint. So break 21 and continue. So at this point, I do a print of list len on head. So it's zero, so the condition is perfectly valid. Mm -hmm. And now I'll do a Fred checkpoint here. Fred creates a checkpoint, and let me put a breakpoint on line 28, say, and continue. So at this point, as you can see, the length of linked list is now 20. Let's just print it list len head. It says it's 20. Now I want to go back to the point where the length of the linked list was 10. So I can do Fred reverse watch list len of head is less than 10. This is my expression. It is currently false. It was true in the beginning. And if you ignore the these debugging messages, like they are just to make sure that uh, I know that it's running, it's not stuck. So it will take some time. And it's logarithmic, so the time doesn't actually scale with the, the time does scale, like you don't have to spend uh, the linear amount of time with the, the computation. So it took about 12 seconds to take you to the location. And let me do a print list len on head. It's saying nine, I can do a next here. Let me say, and it is 10. So the next actually uh, did change the expression. I can, of course, do Fred reverse next, and it will do something and take me back to the location where the length was nine. So uh, this is uh, about Fred, and I did this just to make sure that if I don't have the demo working, but it worked. So uh, uh, both Fred and DMPCP are open source and uh, available online. Thanks. Thank you. Questions? So I'm going to use the moderator's prerogative to ask the first question. Um, so in a lot of areas, mm -hmm. uh, the state of the art for, for debugging you know, remote systems, like for instance, somebody runs something that has an error, is they send you a trace back, and maybe you can get some more information with the CGI TV module or something mm -hmm. like that. But do you see this uh, at all helping with that type of situation? Yep. So what we uh, tend to say is, uh, the checkpoint image is the ultimate bug report. It's basically giving you the entire state of the process, and you can now do whatever you want to do with it. So basically give them the checkpoint image. And uh, so I'll actually just uh, take half a minute to tell one instance. So now uh, we had some uh, users uh, from uh, Taiwan, I think, and they were working on debugging Android. And they wanted to use DMTCP to checkpoint. And we were like, why would you want to checkpoint Android? And they said, well, you know, we have Android going to like televisions and refrigerators and everything, and we don't want the users to bring back the refrigerator to our shop to actually get it repaired because of a software fault. We want them to just create a checkpoint, set us the checkpoint, and we know the rest how to uh, take care of it. So yeah, checkpoint images are the ultimate bug report in this case. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you, does the MTCP support more than just Linux? Uh, no, right now it's just Linux. We think that after a very small amount of work, it should work on BSD, and for Windows, we have no idea. <laughs> yeah. So there are several heuristics. So the very simple one is, if you are writing a file, which uh, if you are always appending to a file, then on restart you can truncate the file and then continue. But the user can actually specify if they want to save the copy of the file with the checkpoint image or not, or if they want to blacklist some files, if there are some read-only files that you don't want to copy them, and, and so on. So there are, this is like totally configurable by the user. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I actually had... 
retrospect the state of the, of the snapshot, like uh, the name of the file names that were open and in which state at the moment of the snapshot and then about subjects and the forms? Uh, so, yeah, you can introspect the checkpoint image to see which files were open, and then you can actually compare them with the current files and see if there is a mismatch. So by default, DMTCP will try to not overwrite your files because uh, there might be something uh, new in there and we don't want to mess up anything. So it just gives you a warning saying, the file already exists, what do you want me to do with it? Either you delete the file and then we'll copy it or, or specify some other solution. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I don't think we have time okay. to start filing it. Let's thank our speaker once again. Thank you.